Today on Rambling About Cars, feelings will be hurt, egos will be bruised. We're going to talk about the most overrated sports car supercars that are out there. And then we're going to talk about some of the underrated supercars and sports cars. And I'm pretty sure we're going to have some differing opinions on this one. It's going to be a fun episode, everybody. So all of you eager enthusiasts out there, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. We're on Rambling About Cars. Across the way is Chris Bruce. Hey, what's, what's new and exciting, man? Uh, not much. Same old, but we have a, a first time guest joining us yes, this week. We, do. we have Brandon Turkus, who is Motor One US's managing editor. And Brandon, as our first time guest, you got to take the rambling about cars quiz. Got to do the quiz. Everybody does right. it. No sweat. No worries. There are no wrong answers. The world will just silently judge you. Which I've been, I've been dealing with that for 36 years. It's fine. <laughs> okay. You want to start you us off, Smith? Yeah, I'll start us off here. Um, okay. Let's see. What's your favorite car from the 1980s? Nothing. The eighties were terrible. Oh I my was born God. in the eighties. I like the, there's nothing good. Oh, came from the 80s. <laughs> oh well, the feelings are getting bruised already. Okay. Like, that, that's a, that's a fair answer. Look, that's I, fair I, answer. I, I, I love, I love the Radwood movement and all that stuff, but man, the eighties just, they just don't do it for me. Um, I need to take a big drink after that one, man. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I'm, okay. a, I'm a 2000s kid, man. Like that was that was when I really got into cars. Right. So it's, right. it's, well, there, there, question there, two goes. There's like a there's like a there's like a 30 year <laughs> gap from like 1970 <laughs> to like 2000 where I just oh, didn't question care about two's not going well. Okay, so question two: What is your favorite car from the 1990s? From the 1990s, ah man, it it's tricky because. You know, I don't really, I don't look back on the time period like fondly, but there was a lot of, there were a lot of interesting cars. Um, you know, from Germany, probably the 190E uh, Cosworth, um, you know, that's from. 80, that's late 80s, isn't it? Is that late I think 80s? I think it's I think early 90s. I think it's early I thought it was early, I think it was like yeah. 90, 94, I want to say. Yeah, the, maybe yeah, not I that late. I think that's early 90s. I'm looking, but I, I keep going. I could be wrong. Okay, okay so um, Japan. Okay. I mean, R33 Skyline, um, RX7, Ooh, Supra. There's, there's definitely um, going to be some some hurt feelings on this episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, there there's some good stuff in the '90s. Yeah, it, it's fine. It's still not my favorite period. I'm I'm like I said, I'm a 2000s kid. That's okay. that's when I got into stuff. That, that, hey, like I said, no wrong answers. It's just. There are thousands of people internally judging you right now. Maybe tens of thousands. I don't know. Maybe this one will go viral. That, that'll be a good thing. Um, third question. Convertible or T-top? Convertible all the way. No question about it. And and it needs to be, I need to say this, it needs to be a soft top convertible. None of this hard top nonsense. It needs to be a soft top convertible. It goes down quicker. It looks better. It's just as good for nvh when the top is up but the thing is you should never be driving with the top up unless it's raining or really cold and i say really cold. no because- no, no really cold isn't an excuse well i mean i've done, like, like, I've done okay. my christmas tours you know with the santa listen suit, I, right I, I, while. I i drove a 911 turbo or 911 targa earlier this year it was 23 degrees out and your damn skippy i had the roof down nice all right bruce what Go ahead, jump in with a question. Quick factual update. Just looked it up. Your 190E, the final version, the Evo 2, came out in 1990. So perfect. It's barely a 90s car. Qualifies. I'm golden. I mean, the 80s, the 80s stuff. You know, the earlier 190s, the E30 M3s. Like they're they're fine. It it just wasn't my, especially for American stuff. America wasn't building anything good in the 80s. (sighs) Nothing. There was there was nothing. Ooh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Right. Send, so, send your emails to podcast at Motor One. <laughs> a, a, attention, Brandon Turkis. Uh, final question. You get one heated seats or heated steering wheel. What are you taking? Heated seats. Cover covers that, more surface area. It's true. You know, I mean, that's what I thought. But I mean, on that question, I think we've been pretty 50 50. So, I think we're starting I, to lean 60 40 for heated seats, but there have been several heated steering wheel people. I've I've lived along and listen. I'm sure the heated steering wheel people are like Clint or Jeff who live somewhere warm and not those of us that have to actually deal with winter. Yeah. 
and realize the superiority of the heated seat. Well, I mean, I mean, if you live in Florida, 60 degrees is winter. I mean, come on. I, I got in, I got in the car with Clint one time when I was down in Miami and it was it wasn't cold. It was cold by Florida standards. It was like 40 or 50 degrees. And poor kid has puffy coat on and <laughs> like heated seats cranked yeah. all the way up. And yeah. Meanwhile, here in Rapid City, South Dakota, in January, if it gets above 35 and the roads are clear, there are Harleys going up and down the street. Yeah, bah, exactly. Bah, 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 bah. Why not? Well, well let's let's uh, let's, let's dig brew some it. let's let's brew some egos here. Let's hurt some feelings. So um, we, yeah, let me in. clarify the genesis of where this is coming from. So person who has been on this show before and who Brandon just mentioned, Jeff Perez, he was covering the Amelia Island Concord to Elegance for us this weekend. And uh, he's already put up one story about Tennessee. Brandon, did you know, does he have any other stuff coming up uh, about that? Or, Bro, I'm on vacation this week. I have absolutely no idea what's coming. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Never mind. Forgot about Good that. <laughs> anyway. we. I, I don't think there is, but check motor1.com just to be sure, everybody. Anyway. So he gets there on Friday and he says the following things from our Slack chat. Slack chat, sorry. Off topic, but I counted no less than 50 Porsches on the drive to into Amelia Island. None of them at all interesting or unique. Brandon, you responded, it sounds like Pebble, Pebble Beach, Concourse de Elegance. Why do people keep buying them in regards oh, to Porsches? Yeah. Mostly 911s, modern and classic. Some came in GT4s, which are kind of cool, I guess, and a few 914s, but mostly 911s. Let me follow this up here. Brandon, you responded, I want to hate on people who just buy a 911 by default, but they're so damn good at everything. And then uh, Jeff had been responding that the 914s at least are different. So that, suffice it if to say, different, if by different he means bad, then yes, Jeff is correct. I mean, this, oh, this we're sparked, gonna have some problems. Okay. <laughs> this, this sparked a bit of a debate. You were about at lunch. Cars that like, are overrated. I was at yeah. lunch. I came back. There was like, I don't know, like 20 some odd pages of no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. I mean, you know, the typical stuff that auto journalists do, right? Right. Because while we all like cars, we all like different cars and we like them for different reasons. And so that gives us different opinions on things. Um, and so, yeah, so that started this conversation. Let, okay. Let's have a conversation about which cars, specifically sports cars, are overrated and which cars are underrated. Um, and so that's what we're going to be presenting here for you guys tonight. We are going to start with the overrated ones. Um, Brand or Smith, I, I think you said you had some images. Do you want to start things oh, off? You want me to jump right in with the uh, with the A80 Supra that's so overrated? Wow. Really? Yeah. The, the, I'm, I'm just kind of sick and just done with the a80 super hey, it's a cool car it's a neat car right here let me go ahead and pull a picture up here just so everybody that's watching, watching can, see. Yeah. can know exactly what we're talking about here oh is that the is that the right screen no that's not the right screen talk I'm about so, the a80 super no, i am i am so the a70 i could see but why the a80 like that's kind of that's the one if, because if you're gonna, was, because it was a Fast and Furious car. I mean, it's, it, it was, it's, it was it's, Fast and Furious. It's t it's totally a contrarian take. Like, I don't like this car because it's the most popular JDM car of the past twenty years. Yeah, Smith. What else about it is overrated? All right, though, all right. Other than my my, my streamyard isn't working again, so I'm I'll, just gonna I'll, I'm just gonna rant about it here. Okay, okay so, you rant. I'll find an image. So. Like I said, it's not a bad car. It's really not a bad car. The uh, the the two JZ, hey, beautiful engine, probably one of the best engines that's ever been built. But it is not the second coming, people. I, I mean, why are people losing their minds? It it wasn't really that great of a handling car. It wasn't terrible, no. but it wasn't great. It was kind of beefy. It had kind of awkward proportions, I think, and. I mean, aside from just putting big turbos on it and making it go super fast in a straight line, which, by the way, you can do to pretty much anything, where where is all this fascination coming from with the A80? Where Where is it coming from? I, it's it's it, the it, movies. I mean, I mean it, it's, it's I mean, totally it, the movies. It has, to, it has to be Fast and Furious. Up to that point, though, I mean, it, it still had a pretty good following, but I don't know. Am I completely wrong? I mean, I'm not, but... 
You're Am I not? Completely? No. So you're reminding me of something that I heard. So this was, I believe, a regular car reviews video. They basically called it a Japanese Trans Am. And that has stuck it's with me fair. because I think it's true. I think that's how you would kind of describe the Supra. It's it's a Japanese Pontiac Trans Am and not saying anything bad about the Trans Am, but it's very much a straight line car. It's basically famous because it appeared in a really, really popular film franchise. And if it weren't for that, I wonder if it would have the cachet that it does. Yeah, no, but, but mean, the, the it, 77 still, Trans Am, I mean, come on, that appeared in Smoking the Bandit and people haven't lost their mind over that. Well, some sure people have. So, sure well, some have. people have, but but no, I, th I think we're forgetting the other thing that the, the Super was well known for and maybe not as well known as some other JDM cars, but Gran Turismo. Yeah. I mean, we uh, you know, we all we all grew up playing Gran Turismo, too. And I, I was a Skyline person personally. Um, I was an RX the, guy. The Kelsonic. I had Skyline the 3000 GTR. GT. <laughs> we all picked him. <laughs> none but, of us picked the but, Supra. None, none of us picked the Supra. Supra. No, oh, because, that's telling right there. You remember that in in GT two, like rear drive, like high powered rear drive cars were undrivable. You had to have all wheel drive. Yep. Oh no, you just but, put a ton of power and then you just bounced them off the edge of the track for the entire race, and you still won because the AI was terrible. Yeah, but no, I mean it, it was. True. It, I, I think it's it's the Supra is very much a product of of uh fast and furious and also gran turismo and i think we're seeing it you know if you look at the the trend now of you know the rad trend of i want cars from the 80s and early 90s it's very much driven by people that are coming into money now and mm -hmm. want the cars that they saw in the movies and that they saw that they played in racing games and that's why you know the super is the most visible version of that. And it also helps that they they made a hell of a lot of them by by you know the stand, they weren't an uncommon car. Um, maybe maybe they were in the U.S., but you can import them, and there there are options yeah, to getting yeah. for getting them. I blame so, the car. I finally got my screen share to work. I blame that car right there. That that's Bruce. You wrote that article. That's the actual screen used. Super from from the first fast film. That, that's the hero car. Yeah, that's the that's one. The hero that, car. But the hero exterior car, I should say. That was the, all the exteriors. That was the one that you saw. Are, are there any estimates as to what that's going to bring at auction? Because I mean, regular A eighties are. are it's going to be what, easy six, six figures. figures. Oh, oh yeah, be easy six figures. I mean, the one, the last one that sold was one hundred eighty five Smith. I think you have. I'll look it up. Yeah, but, but was that like a low mileage example? I mean, I, so the I one don't that think previously you... sold was non turbo and a manual. This one is turbo and automatic. That's not that. All right. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, screen used hero car. I mean, I'm I enjoyed the fast films. I remember so, when they first came out, I, I kind of felt like making fun of them a little bit. But then I realized, oh, OK, this is kind of cool. And they've gotten admittedly a little silly over the years. But I just well, they said yeah, they sent I'm, guys I'm, into space. Well, well, they're, that's, they're going. That, that's, they're about to. We don't know that they're going into space. It may just be like low Earth orbit, you know, like a like an Alan Shepard kind of thing. That's so, uh, that that <laughs> no, that, for that's anyone debatable. watching on YouTube. Wait, real quick. So, anyone watching on YouTube in 2015, a screen used one sold for $185,000. And like I said, that one was uh, naturally aspirated, but a five speed. The one that's going to be up for auction now is a turbo, but an automatic. And it also, as I understand it, the one that's going up for auction now uh, was kind of it appeared more often. Um, on screen so i i don't i don't think we can really like the super is goodness i don't think we can really like put too much stock in what the ones that were in the movies end up going for i, th I think it's more about the the ones that weren't you know aren't necessarily famous but are supras and are desirable because they're you know 2jz or manual or whatever and those ones are you know 50 60 70 thousand dollar cars when you know for low mileage examples and mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's unreasonable. I, you know, mm. there, there are a lot of cars in, in that era that if they come in and they say, you know, I've got X, Y, or Z, and it only has 10,000 miles on it, people are going to snap it up. But so if I see uh, an A80 Supra, turbo, manual, everything that you want, parked next to 
a 3000 GT VR4, especially if it's the Spider. I'm taking the 3000 GT VR4 every day of the week. Now, why isn't that 3000 GT VR4 50, 60 grand? If you look around, you can actually find those surprisingly, because- shockingly reasonable. Now, I know they're heavy, they're all wheel drive, they didn't handle that great, but you know what? The Super also didn't handle that great, right? Yeah, but the three the three thousand GT was like they were thick on the ground over here. Like you could find Mitsubishi badge models, you could find Dodge Stealths. They were not uncommon. Sure, I feel like a Supra, at least in the United States, was not necessarily uncommon, but you might struggle to find a good example nowadays. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they've they've gotten used over the years for sure. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we need to move on because I know yeah, everybody. We, we else got a lot more cars opinion. to talk about. We got a lot more. Okay. Bruce, why don't you why don't you take us? Sure thing. We'll, so, we'll spare Brandon for the moment here. Yeah, Brandon gets to go last, um, or at least on this round. So uh, this this brand, who I will be pulling up an image of now, they're still kind of going through a rough period. Brandon, I think you're going to tell me they're about to emerge emerge from a rough period. But oh boy, Maserati Spider. Ah, yes, yes. I this was on this is on my list for like cars that are underrated. You think oh. this is overrated, Bruce? I think this is overrated. I no, think this it's is- fantastic. It's a Ferrari V8 and a six-speed manual. It's rear drive and a roadster. What What are you on about? And it's Pininfarina style, I think. I, I could be wrong there, but... No, I think you're... No, Gigero. I'm looking at it right now. Gigero. Um, okay. But it's the worst period of Maserati that they've been kind of in the doldrums whoa, whoa, in for whoa, years. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Maserati has been around for 70 years, and there have been a lot of worse periods. You cannot classify... <laughs> This one is the worst. <laughs> I like how you phrase that. There have been a lot of worse periods. Yeah. I mean, like this is Maserati guess, we're talking about here. Hey, at least in the eighties, the bi turbo appeared in Miami Vice. No one that was like, that was the worst era. That <laughs> no, this is worse. This is worse because this mm. is bad styling on top of bad reliability. Bad styling. And it looks fantastic. It it, it yeah. looks like a marshmallow. Yeah, everything in the early ninety or late <laughs> early two thousands looked like a marshmallow. Not but it has a Ferrari. Reason. It was a Ferrari V eight and it has the right badge. Well, well let's stop right drive. there. It has the Ferrari V eight, so it's going to need like ten thousand dollars worth of service every five thousand miles. If you're buying a Maserati. You should know that it's it's an Italian <laughs> car. It's it's not so much it, as a negative. It's more that it's an Italian engine than that it's a Ferrari engine. I mean, seriously, if I'm going to spend ten thousand dollars in maintenance every five thousand miles, I'll buy the Ferrari. Yeah, but you can't find a Ferrari for the same price. You can you can get yeah. one of those for twenty grand in yeah. good shape, yeah. low mileage. But yeah, I still, I still don't fun. think it's over. Lots though. of deferred maintenance. Oops, wrong. Yeah, same sure, picture. maybe. I still don't think it's overrated though. I do. I just I don't think there's anything special about those cars. I think that they came from the worst period of that brand. Well, I. Oh, that looks so good. No, it, it doesn't. So Those good. weird, like boxy tail. It looks like lights. somebody. It looks like yeah. Compared to the front, it looks like somebody like photoshopped a Volvo ass end on that or something. It looks like it no, wants to be an Audi perfect. TT and can. <laughs> it's better I, than a TT. I, I but I but to but but to maybe answer a broader question here, we're talking about overrated cars. Just being unloved or loved. Well, in this case, just being unloved doesn't mean it's overrated, does it? I I just see no appeal in this car. I think if you look at vehicles from the same era, I would much rather have an SL class of the same time. I'd much rather have the Ferrari of the same time. It's a different kind of vehicle. I mean, the the SL class is a different kind of vehicle. They didn't make a front engine rear drive V8. Well, they didn't make, yeah, they didn't make a front engine rear drive V8 Ferrari in that era. Um, You know, that is, that is, a very unique vehicle for that time period. And you know, that that's why I would have it. Like I, I love the yeah, fact I'd rather that have a BMW Z eight though. The BMW Z eight looks significantly better. It does have, yeah, but a you V8. can't find, you can't find drive. a BMW Z eight for less than a hundred grand. Well, that's because they're they, cool. They don't exist. That's because, they, that's because people want them. <laughs> so, is, so is that. <laughs> that is no, cool. people don't want them. As you said, and I agree with you. Right. That's a $25,000 people- car. I hope people keep not wanting them so I can buy one one day. I'd have the coupe, though. I, I prefer the lines on the coupe. But V8, it. manual, rear-wheel drive, Ferrari engine, done. I, I, 
it's, I mean, it's it looks good me. sitting in the shop. <laughs> yeah, so does every Italian car. <laughs> Where Where's your Ferrari? It's in the shop. Where's your Lancia? It's in the shop. I'm Lock looking over here at my better. overrated list, and I'm getting a little worried if it, uh, if if we Wait, have time for another round here. Here's your coupe, just for everyone. Let's, let's take a look. Oh, I think it's the fantastic. coupe looks a little bit better. Yeah, look, I see look, at, look at the scale. Look at the scallop on that C pit, like the the rear quarter window and the C pillar, like that. That's amazing. The the coupe it's looks so better. pretty. The coupe looks a little bit better, but again, I mean, I just keep coming back to: is this really an overrated car? It's not. Maybe I'm all. wrong. It is to I me. I think it's a great. I think it's a great car. Okay. I, well, Brandon, I would have it's one your turn. It's all your right, turn. Brandon. Break our hearts, I mean, man. You, you guys, you guys. I'm, I'm disappointed, frankly. Oh boy! Just I, wait. I expected, oh, I just expected wait. more. I expected more outrageous takes. If I were, if I were going to be, well, I'm not entire- done. <laughs> okay. All right. That's well. That's good to know. Um, yeah, my a- say, a- my super take was probably the mild one. I'm going to say the Aston Martin DB7. Uh, okay. Hmm. Oh, that was that was a vote of confidence. Oh, oh, that, okay. That he was agree- okay. The I'm tone going, of that. Well, on on what grounds? You think it's overrated? Because I, I, I think it's over. I think it's hilariously under- overrated. Why? Because I can get a Jag XK. That's the same thing for significantly less money. I don't think it's ter- I I don't think it's an attractive Aston Martin, and and that's a that's a problem because every Aston Martin is pretty. Um, I just, I don't love it. I don't see, I don't get the fuss over the DB seven. Every time I see one, I, I, I look at those, those stupid taillights on it and that, that Jaguar esque front end. And I just, I recoil and it, and part of this might be because it was followed by the DB nine, which I think is still one of the prettiest ass Martins ever made. Um, yeah, look at the, it's just, it's just, awkward and ungainly and those wheels do it no fa- no favors and yeah yeah but so i agree with you on the xk8 take that basically they're the same vehicle you know with different badges but the thing with the austin martin is you can get the v12 yeah and get- a, a v, a v I, I love a v12 i i will never say no to a v12 but man when that's the only redeeming quality really the the Jag is better looking. I mean, that is it's just it doesn't look as good as an, as an Aston should. And you've got Ford switch gear on the inside, and it's just nah, nope, no thank you. Here are the well, tail lights you Ford under the bus then. That was the Ford the, era. Oh, the right? taillights are the worst. The taillights <laughs> are so bad. I actually don't think they're that bad. You know, you they know, look I'm like they could have come off a of Mondeo. Maybe they, they probably did. did, but they probably they don't did. Look bad. <laughs> no, they look hideous. I hate them. Ah. That's my least favorite angle of that car. I find and those myself... wheels. The, listen, I normally like like those big, you know, obnoxious wheels, but they did not do that car any favors. No, the, those wheels no, are those they're, they're just great. they're just ugly. They're just straight up ugly. I find myself it's not in really maroon. having much of an opinion, um, which maybe is kind of telling. I'm. I mean, is that really again? Is that really an overrated car? I mean, I, think I, guess, I guess I think I think people like revere those things for. I guess you could reason. say, well, I well, think it, people do revere the Aston, B12s. You know, it hasn't it, it has an Aston badge, so therefore it must be amazing. Um, and on that grounds, I mean, I guess I could see it being overrated. Well, it's the ones with the supercharged not, V6 get no love, or inline yeah. six get no love. Like that, but I think the V12 is Brandon. Here's an XK8 just for comparison. Uh, also a coupe. I mean, I will say, I mean, that DB7 isn't on my list of I would really See, like to that have. Is, that is better. It's it's not great. It's not a super pretty car, but it is better. The The lines simply suit Jaguar better than they do Ashton Mark. The, That's they really do. what it comes down to. I'll give you that. And for some reason, that particular image, that just looks like the rally version. I mean, does it? Is it, it does, does, oh, it's, it's, it's on it looks like it's sitting. It looks like it's I mean, it's ready for Baja, right? Just, it's just sitting a little. Yeah, they, they forgot to take they forgot to take spacers out of that. They shipped it. With. <laughs> I kind of I, I kind of really like it sitting up like that. That's a that's a that's a weird take. I know. But so, I, I have a few of those. So we're at 25 minutes. We're trying to keep this first segment to half an hour. So lightning round. So lightning round? Smith, you're up. Yeah. Real quick. We'll get like two minutes with each of them. Lightning round. Overrated. Go for it. Any old Ferrari. 
what bring in bring old. in bring in the that's, hate that's man. kind of a wide net i mean yeah, yeah well well he, here's the thing and i say this because i mean i adore ferrari i would there are so many ferraris i would love to have but you can sort of put this to any supercar manufacturer they people accept standards from them that they would never ever ever accept from more volume manufacturers and maybe that makes them a little bit more niche or a little bit more desirable but kind of like i was alluding to earlier with the maserati could you imagine if ford offered a vehicle and said hey this vehicle has 450 horsepower or or in this day okay it has 850 horsepower zero to 60 in like three seconds la 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 la. we'll sell it for four hundred fifty thousand dollars okay but you're gonna have to bring it in for service every ten thousand miles and it's gonna cost you ten grand it's it's like full stop screech and it's like why are why are the supercar brands and ferrari's kind of notorious for that very very expensive services why i mean the people talk about them being engineered wonderfully they can't engineer the engines better to last longer well i mean i don't think i don't that's, think it's that's, that's, that's my engine. take i don't think it's necessarily about the engines lasting longer and i'm i'm gonna regale you with a, a story from my misspent youth you know, when I went, when I was delivering press cars, we had the first Audi R8s that came out. And to do some simple work on those mid-engine cars, it was an engine out service. Mm-hmm. And I don't think this was necessarily a fault of the engine or the car or the engineers, but that was just the way it is. And I kind of imagine it's the same thing with Ferrari, that, you know, the cars are well engineered. They will work, but maintaining them to work is going to require uh, some more significant levels of maintenance. But I, yep. my, my real my real question, Smith, is what is your definition of old Ferrari? Because if you're saying that a 250 GTO is overrated, I'm just going to fire you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why I kind of cast the net broadly, because one, I don't want to be fired. <laughs> but, but two, I mean, the modern Ferrari, it's it's like they, they seem to have, have kind of caught on. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of companies that are making high-end cars now. Maybe we need to focus a little bit more on setting our cars up so they last a little bit longer without needing such constant, specifically spaced intervals of expensive maintenance. And you're right. A lot of the work, it, it's an engine up procedure. But come on, you have you have lash adjustments and things that need to take place. What like every twenty or thirty thousand miles on some of these cars? It it just seems like, but it seems it, it seems like they weren't thinking about you know actually building something to really hold up. But just hey, make it go fast. But, which there's nothing wrong with here, going no, no, fast. No, here, here, here's, here's the other problem: is that no, we're, we're doing the thing. <laughs> this is this is happening now. Well, no. Here's the thing. You, you know, it needs it. It needs this service item every twenty or thirty thousand miles. Well, the vehicles aren't being driven twelve thousand miles a year. They're they're being they driven. Be. They should they, be. Yes, that yeah. that is a point, and I I would write that op ed. But the reality is that they're being driven two or three thousand miles a year, and if that you know, if that, hopefully at least that, and. You know, those maintenance items are less of a concern when you're spending that that money every two or three years rather than every six months. And I I think it's important. I think it's important that you you, that you look at it that way and say people that are buying these cars are not using them the way Smith that you use your Mustang or that I use whatever press car I have or Chris, you use your Subaru. You know, people don't use them the same way. But I, I think, I, I feel like Ferrari and also Lamborghini and other, other the we'll say the legacy supercar brands, they're kind of realizing now, uh, maybe we need to put a little bit more emphasis on making these things a little less maintenance intensive. And they're realizing that, okay, yeah, we can. We don't need to just milk people for maintenance money. Okay. Okay. Lightning that's round. your point. Yeah, that's your point. Um, real quick. 30 what? seconds. 3000 GT Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4 massively overrated. I what? would much rather pay the same amount of money for a Lancer Evo and have something that is going to handle far better and well maybe not look better but certainly handle far better and be faster. It's it's a ba- it's not a bad car, it's a dumb car. It that's fair. I I I'm I'm fine with that. It's not overrated. 
Also, I, I would I would take the Evo. I'll full disclosure. I would take the Evo over the three thousand GT. Okay, but the three thousand GT isn't. It's not an overrated car. It is. Okay, it's Brandon. Not- one minute. What's you? <laughs> what, what are you up? What do you got? Ferrari F fifty. Oh, go to hell! <laughs> the, the guy Look that's at giving it. me sass it. over the, over Ferrari comes in with it the Ferrari. The same, it is the same problem. Hey, listen, yo. I almost said Enzo, but I didn't because I think the Enzo is actually like an interesting design. The F50 is an uninteresting piece of design. It is the size of a small moon. The thing is, the thing (laughs) is, okay, that's true. Huge. It is huge. And it just doesn't look that good. And yeah, I I know that one's going to be unpopular, but I, I really feel like, Ferrari laid an egg with that one after the F40 and before the Enzo. And I just, I don't love it. I've never loved it. And nothing is going to change my mind. Yeah, look at that. It's huge. It's huge. I have the same issue with the Maserati MC12. It is also enormous. And I know it's based on an Enzo. That's just an Enzo. But an an Enzo doesn't look that visually massive. Yeah, the the Maserati version, I mean, it's almost like... it's, it's the it's size like of a the, Range Rover. It's, it's like the Charger Daytona. It's like the classic Charger Daytona of supercars. Yeah. Let's stick a big nose on it, a big wing at the back, and we'll call it something different. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't know that the F50 is overrated. I see your arguments. Well, maybe it is a little overrated, but I, I think mean, it's overrated. I, th- I think that I that, think that right V12, now, and I do kind of dig the styling a little bit. I, I think we're in a like period right now where too. people are still ranting and raving over the F40. And that in the next few years, that ranting and raving will go towards the F50, and I'm just not here for it. Oh, I agree with you there. The F40 I, I, is a I, far, far better vehicle than the F50 in terms of looks, in terms of innovation. Like, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll agree on that front. I'll agree on that front. I don't want to shift F40 love to F50 just because of age. No. And I don't no. think that'll happen. That, but that's what's going to happen. I don't think so. The F40 See, is just does, such. It doesn't look bad from that angle. I I just I can't. Stand, it doesn't look great from that angle. It kind of looks a little chubby from, from that, that angle. angle. I I don't love the idea of a flagship Ferrari being a convertible. I don't love that it has that those stupid nostrils on the hood. I I that angle is not bad, but from the front, I just can't stand it. I I want nothing to do with it. Looks good from the back. Right. I'll I'll say that. Okay, well, folks. Those are the ones we think are underrated. So just stay tuned. For <laughs> no, 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 no. Those, are overrated. Yes. That's yes. overrated. Those are the ones we think are overrated. Just stay tuned for what we think are underrated. But uh, now is our middle section of the show where we actually we received a really good email this week. We did. Um, I, as always, I won't say names just in case people have privacy concerns, but I will go ahead and read it. So this is someone that uh, last week we talked about the early performance trucks and Smith and I both kind of thought that the Dodge Little Red Express was the first one that existed. Mm -hmm. And we were wrong, as it turns out. Um, So for 1964 and 1965, Dodge offered two packages. They offered the custom sport special, which was kind of just basically a styling package. But then they also offered, uh, oh, I lost it. The high performance package, which lets you get the um, the max wedge engine in the Dodge D100 pickup at the time. Um, and so I've got some info pulled up about that here. And vamp for me a second, Smith. I didn't have my link as ready as I thought I did. So, I mean, yeah, if you didn't catch our episode last week, I mean, we were talking about briefly the uh, the new lightning that came out, which all electric, much faster than the original lightning. Uh, but we were also talking about some of the performance trucks that could very well be why we're looking at a brand new electric lightning now. Some of the performance trucks, the street trucks that led up to that first generation lightning in the early 90s. And I mean, yeah, as we were nosing around, I mean, I think everybody knows about the Little Red Express trucks from 78 and 79. Um, I mean, we were looking around further, but uh, that's the nice thing about automotive enthusiasts and the automotive community, because it's our job to know quite a bit or a fair amount about as much as we can but there are always people out there with a specialized knowledge where they know i mean they'll have forgotten more stuff than a lot of other people will have ever known about vehicles right. and that's and that's where this that's where this find comes uh, comes about 
So the if you're watching on YouTube, this comes from the Custom Sports Special, which was the name of the one package, and the High Performance Package Registry. So the Custom Sports spe Special was kind of just more like badges and stripes. So you got the bucket seats from the Dodge Dart, the center console from the Dodge Polara, carpeted floor mats, a chrome front bumper, things like that. But then if you went further or separately, you could get the High Performance Package, and that lets you get the 426 street wedge engine, which is massive. And uh, it made 365 horsepower. You also got power steering, uh, a different instrument cluster, dual exhaust wow. and a revised um, suspension. And not many of them actually got built. Um, uh, Motor Trend wrote a story last year at the same time that the TRX came out that 50 of them got built. According to this registry, they're showing 22, which that makes sense. Not everyone who has one is going to register one. So they're quite rare. But this is a vehicle that existed in the mid 60s that was really, uh, unless any of our other listeners can find another one, this was the first performance truck that came out. And how cool is that? I never knew this existed. And I mean, yeah, obviously, with here. such low production numbers, I imagine a lot of people didn't know this existed. So rambling about cars, listeners, you are the best. Thank you so much for sending this information in. And this is a good time to remind everybody, if you want to get in touch with us, podcast at motorone.com is the email. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at CH writing. Bruce, you've got your Twitter account. What's your Twitter again? Uh, Chris Bruce, 1985. It's easy. Hit us up with questions. Hit us up with ideas um, on the occasional um, situation where we make mistakes. I guess it, you can call happens. us out a little bit. It happens from time to time, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I mean, just we're looking at this um, on on YouTube. If you're not listening, yeah, you can so check this on just YouTube real quick, I just wanted to give credit to the Motor Trend story, which was yep. one of the better sources for information. But yeah, uh, 360 horsepower. Um, and then later 365, but yeah, just, you know, it looked kind of like a basic truck if you didn't yeah. get the custom sport package, but it had this massive engine underneath. Total uh, sleeper. Yeah, the motor, the high performance package apparently cost $1,235, which at the time was 10 grand. So that that's, that's a hefty markup. And yeah, again, this is where I saw the 50 trucks built. Um, I can't verify that. Like I said, the registry had like 22, 23. So it's something like that, but certainly not many, um, but interesting. Very interesting. And hey, more shout out to, uh, to some truck love. Yep. So are we ready then? I think so. Are uh, we ready for underrated? Yeah. Why don't we just continue with the same thing? So Smith, do you want to go first with underrated? No, let's, let's, let's give our guest the uh, distinguished honor of, Certainly. of stepping us off into this new round of debate. This underrated sports car. So I get to, I get to plug the site. I get to plug a story I wrote um, and talk about an underrated sports car. Hi Cooper. Nice to see you too. Um, so recently I ventured over to Modena, Italy and drove the Maserati MC20. And this Ooh. is this is a new this is a new sports car, um mid-engine uh twin turbocharged V6, yep. 621 horsepower, 623 or something like that. Um and you know I I defended that Maserati that that Chris posted earlier. <laughs> But but the re the reality is that Maserati as a brand is kind of struggled in a lot of ways uh, it, throughout its you know ninety year history, um, especially over the last twenty years. This is the and, and I'm bringing this up because I feel like we haven't really heard a lot about the MC20. I don't feel like there's a ton of really you know breathless commentary on on this new product when in reality there's there's a lot about it that's that is very very exciting and i i think that it it kind of sets itself apart from the past 20 years of of maseratis with you know a, a factory built engine the engine is built in in mode nut like literally like 50 feet from where the car is built it's 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 crazy. Like I, I toured the factory while I was there. Um, and 
yeah, it, it feels like a very special car for Maserati, the brand. Uh, I think the owners will find it to be very different than the past 20 years of Maserati. It, it drives beautifully. It is an absolute joy to drive. I'm, I'm really excited to get one here in the U.S. and spend some more time with it on roads that I know. But yeah, I, I, I just I haven't heard a lot about it. Like it kind of debuted. Um, I want to say late last year. I think it was like September or August or something like that. Sounds right. And it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it was like radio silence after that. And, you know, after having driven it and seeing where it's built and seeing the engine, the engine plant and the paint shop and all of this stuff, it's just it's a it's a really exciting car. And I, I hope it does well for Maserati because, it, you know, the brand needs needs some wins. And this mm-hmm. definitely feels like one. You know, I, I mean, we're looking at it now. Uh, if you're not following on YouTube, we're looking at the car now. Brandon, I can't really disagree with you on this one. Um, I mean, last year, obviously, COVID kind of just socked everybody um, in all industries, obviously, but the auto industry uh, uh, specifically. So I, I think that might be part of the reason why it kind of went under the radar. But I mean, you're right. It's, I mean, when you look at some of the other vehicles that have just been hyped and hyped and hyped to death, um, Maserati didn't have much to say on this mm-hmm. and looking at it, I mean, with, with the dihedral doors open like that, I just, I think it's a mean looking car. I think it's one of the best looking Maseratis in a long time. Um, I yep. like the, I like the idea that they're making their own engine. Right. I wanted to mention that the fact that what, for the past 20 years 20, plus 20 years. Yeah. It's been, they've been, been Ferrari, Ferrari engines. engines. And so the fact that they're finally making their own engine again, and even before that, if you think about uh, they were using Citroen engines because Citroen owned them. So it's been a while for a truly Maserati yeah, it's, built it's engine. Been, it's been literally decades since they were building engines in Modena. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the engine fact or the engine plant is extremely modern. It's the, the en- they're only building, I want to say, I, I don't remember for certain, but I think they have the engine production matched to the chassis production, and they're only building six cars a day. Wow. Oh, wow. And yeah, so six cars a day, hand built. Uh, the engine plant is 12 people. You know, it, <laughs> it, it is 12. You know, this this is not like, you know, AMG where it's one person, one engine. It's it's 12 people. All engines. For, <laughs> <laughs> all, all engines for an entire line of vehicles. And yeah, that'll expand. And, you know, the, the, the engine technology that makes this, this, the three liter V6 special can be applied to other Masra or other future engines, but man, it's just, it's, it's an honest and exciting effort from a brand that, you know, I think every like car enthusiast wants to see succeed. I don't think any, you'll ever find anyone that says, God, I hope Maserati fails. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Through that. And I, this I is think, a big deal that, because, because I mean, not many people have driven this car yet, and you have. You yeah, have driven yeah, it. Yeah, it was we were very fortunate. I you know, our, our friends in Europe uh have been had more had better access to it. Uh we Motor One along with our good friends at Road and Track and another site that's escaping me right now are the only ones that have driven this car so far, um, you know, because of COVID and all that stuff. And Mm -hmm. it was great to be able to go over and uh, explore the factory and drive the car. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a dynamite car. I mean, I'm really eager to get one here in the U S and spend more time with it because you know, the couple hours that I had in Italy were just not enough. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I, I mean, we're supposed to be debating on this one. I've, I've got nothing. I think you, I think you hit it right on the head. I yeah, mean, it's I a brand new you. car, so it's. I mean, I guess you could say, well, I mean, yeah, it's a brand new car. How can it be underrated? Nobody knows it. Well, when That's you see what no Toyota did, about. when you see what Toyota did with a Supra leading up years and Acura, years, the and, NSX. And, yeah, I mean, so many other cars have been hyped up, and yeah, this one isn't. So Maserati, and just, and just think, this, step this up your just, game a little bit. This is just the coupe. Like, there's going to be a convertible version coming, which I cannot wait for. Oh, I think that's going to be fantastic. Be better. Mm-hmm. And they're going to do an all electric version. It's going to be the same basic monocoque, all electric. I don't know how much power it has or how much range it's going to have, but it sounds amazing. They're going to be building a, a coupe, a convertible, and an EV on the same same basic platform. That's that's nuts. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited for it. 
Well, Brandon, all of that excitement you have, I'm about to destroy it. <laughs> so oh, just boy. prepare yourself. This is a vehicle that was mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, I If you say NSX, I'm going to lose my mind. No, hold on. I, I put the wrong image up. That's mine. It is the Porsche 914. Uh, Underrated? Uh, yes, I, I need myself a Volkswagen-powered Porsche. <laughs> but... Well, aren't they all Volkswagen powered? Come on. Yeah, but this Someone one was like a pretty egregious. Weren't you defending the Porsche 912 recently? That's how how are no, they different? No, no, no. I was I was not I was not defending it. I was I was harassing Jeff. Okay. <laughs> to fair difference. There, 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 there's it's very different. He said something about how could you buy a 911, or I'm I'm paraphrasing, or don't drive your 911 to to right. Amelia Island. And I said, but Jeff, I have a 912, and he said that's still applied. So so full disclosure, and I will put it up in a second. This one is currently for sale on Bring a Trailer, but the only reason I picked it was because I couldn't find good images of one with the chrome bumpers. I don't usually like chrome bumpers on a car. I think they look fantastic on the 914. Also, if I hadn't, if you could give it to me, burnt orange on a 914 is just chef's kiss. Like, I love this car so much, and I know a lot of people don't, and I kind of get it. It's the entry-level Porsche of the time, but people don't get mad about Boxster owners. Like, you know, people don't get, no, give well, it, give I guess, it 20 years. I well, guess the, 924 owners get decent. a little bit. I mean, I mean, this just looks like a piece of plywood with a with a windshield. That, that, that's what always got me. It's just, it, it's like when you look at the 911, that's just curvaceous and interesting, and then it's like, Let's try to design something that's just completely non-interesting in every way. And there you I have. I disagree, though. I disagree. Which, which, which what side is the front? <laughs> but that's wait, if, you can't, if you can't tell which end of your car is the front and which end of the car is the back, there's a problem. But form follows uh, there's function. A, there's, a, there's, there's a design to do all that stuff flaw the there. <laughs> They didn't. If you cut, if you cut a car, if you cut a car in half lengthwise, it should be symmetrical. If you cut a car in half widthwise, it should not be symmetrical. That's what <laughs> this this car is symmetrical when you cut it in half widthwise. Yeah. Sorry, Bruce. I uh, I think it's underrated for a reason. Listen, and I'm sure, it might it might it I'm might sure be fabulous to drive. to drive. Yeah, it might be it might be great to drive. I've never driven a nine one four. But I, I hear the nine one four six is pretty dynamite. But well, there's like seventeen of those in the world. So well, there are more. Yeah, I mean, they're I'm, rare. I'm sure, the I'm four sure, cylinders sure are, right. you know, far more common. But, but you know, I, I look, I look at the nine one four, and I look at the the four cylinder seven one eight that are out right now, and I just kind of figured out that I don't want a four cylinder Porsche ever. Mm. <sighs> to me, it's not about the cylinders; it's about the power, right? I wouldn't. I, I mean, I have no be problem. Flat, with it should a, be a flat six. <sighs> well, they made that, just not very many of them. Like that's a thing that exists. No, oh, I know. I just, I just can't get past the styling. If you I were to like park, it. if you were to debadge that and debadge a nine eleven of the same era and park them side by side, there is no, no conceivable way anybody in their right mind would say, "Well, these came from the same manufacturer." No, you're right. No, the 911 came from Porsche, and then this other thing probably came from what Fiat. Yeah, I was gonna say for a, for the longest time as a little kid, I didn't know the difference between a 914 and a Fiat X19. <laughs> I was about to say that. I had no idea if they were different cars. Oh, we're we're hurting here. Bruce's feelings yeah, here. You really are. Uh, hey, we yeah, all have no. our quirks. Well, yeah, I've I've taken enough crap over the years for liking the Mustang too. So it, I I understand where you're at. It happens. We all. We all have our quirky loves in life. Well, why don't you guys go ahead and get ready to trash me? Wait, wait, wait. So super quick oh, here. You, oh, you've got more. Okay. You've no, got no, no, more. no. I don't actually. I, I just, I, I want to show a Fiat X19 just for any of our YouTube watchers who are seeing this. And it's it's a slant nose 914. I mean, that's really, that's all you need to know. Well, it could be here. Here it is for any of our Let's watchers there. There's an X19, which I like this car too. So slant maybe, nose 914. Paint paint the B pillar black. Yeah, slant nose 914. I like them both though. I love that design I, I language. Think I think that's hideous. 
Well, we're I don't think it's agree to disagree. Hideous. I'm I'm not too keen on it. Why is um, it bedpan green? <laughs> well, that's just a press photo from the 70s. Because, they didn't because understand that's the colors 70s. at the time. <laughs> bedpan that's green. Okay. Three letters, LSD. That's what you need to know right there. Smith, your turn. All right. Um, you know what? I, I won't give this a auditory introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. We'll let everybody laugh. How bad is this? And, and then I'll jump in here. So there you go. Oh, Do you know what bad. that is? That's it's, that's a C4 Corvette. Right. But it's not any C4 Corvette. The CR1. It's it's the it's the OG. Well, I guess not the OG ZR1 because that was in the 70s. But this is the 1990 to 1995 Chevrolet Corvette ZR1 with the double overhead cam, 5.7 liter V8. How is this, that underrated at all? Those things are like 35 nice grand. Yeah, the, that's they're totally underrated. Everybody talks about Corvette. They talk about the newer stuff or they talk about the older stuff. And everybody. Just I mean, how many how many of those do they build? Forgets. How many, That's how many the best those, C4 of, they made. They, they didn't yeah, build. Many, they but, didn't how, build a lot of them. But the my the point is, so nobody's nobody's paying attention to them. Nobody's interested, right? So let me get let me get I, this straight. The, the the Corvette, a car that is renowned for its reliance on overhead valves, the best version of the Corvette is the dual overhead cam. Is what you're saying? The, the, the best C4 version. It is. The best version of the C4. Oh, the, those right. cars are fantastic! With that that high revving V8, they sound nothing like any other Corvette that lived up that, that was around up to that point. And I mean, until the new Z06 comes out, I, I mean, this is still in a class by itself. And people have just kind of, I, I mean, it, it's not. I don't think it's poo pooed, but it's just like, eh, what was that, you know? And it's just like. This was such a fantastic car for the time. I mean, we're talking, th this was right up there with everything else in the world. In 1990, when that came out, I mean, you're talking the, the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis, the the Bugattis, and obviously the McLarens that were going to come later. The, they, I mean, they were like the first hypercars, really. But this was right there, 395 horsepower. Then it went to, I think, 405 a little bit later on. I still lust after these cars. And if you look around, I mean, you can buy these for like 20, 25 grand. So real quick, total production I'm looking at now, uh, right around 6,900, which yeah. is not a lot, but it's not well, a little either. It, it was, it was seriously expensive back in the day. I can't remember oh, yeah. the sticker price, it, but I mean, it was, it was seriously expensive, but it was such a but departure for Corvettes and the performance was just epic on that car and like when you go to a corvette meet i went to a big corvette meet out here in south dakota back when the c8 that was actually the same week that the c8 was announced and i was all excited to see a bunch of c4 zr1s or at least see a few and i didn't see a single one but i i don't think that proves that it's underrated i just think that shows that it's rare like yeah i, I agree I with you yeah. it's a cool car i just don't think it's underrated i just don't think that many I'll, of them I'll, exist it, I'll be honest. I didn't realize they did a dual overhead cam, dual overhead cam yeah. Corvette until you just brought it up. Now I'd never yeah, heard that, of this car. I, Lotus I think design, it's very cool. Right? Um, I I think Lotus was on it. Mercury Marine Mer was Lotus on it. designed it. Mercury Marine built it. I want to say and Is yeah, that work something double like double overhead yeah. cam three fifty. I think that I think a red line of like seven or a little over seven thousand RPM. I mean, That's when great. you hear one go, I mean it's just I, a cool I, I car. I love the idea of Corvette doing you know outside of the box thing i things i think there are a few a few lines of vehicles in the in the industry that are just way too addicted to their own legend and the, the corvette same formula is chief corvette among is, them. Is, yes yeah i, I agree yeah. i mean yeah uh, the overhead valve engine is like the wood burning stove of engines and <laughs> everyone else is is <laughs> Doing but it's not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a bad. It's thing not a bad. It's not a double bad overhead thing, cams have been around since like what like the like the early 1920s or or even okay. earlier. I mean it's 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 old technology too. Um, but if you were to line up a C4 ZR1 and a C6 ZR1, I'd take the C4 every single day of the week just because it's cool with 400 horsepower. It's still not going to be slow. I don't need the 640 and the C6. That's a, that's can I, a ridiculous amount of Can I, can I tell horsepower. you guys my, my special theory about performance cars? Okay. Uh -oh. 
Okay. 400 horsepower is the perfect amount of power. It doesn't matter the car. 400 horsepower is perfect. You never need any more than that. Brandon, I think you and I just became really good friends. Yeah. My theory theory is a little bit higher. Listen, (laughs) I've driven driven 800 horsepower cars. I've driven 700 horsepower cars. I've driven 650 horsepower. Literally everything from 95 horsepower on up to 800. 400 to 425, 440 is the perfect amount. You do not need any more. And the reason for that... Because I'm with you on that. My my threshold is around 500 or so. The reason for that, anything over that, when you mash the gas, you're either just blowing up the tires in smoke or you're yep. letting the computer control automatically cut your power back down to where it should be anyways. Yep. The only place that you're really going to use that extra horsepower is when you're really stretching the legs on the highway somewhere where, I mean. Which you're not allowed to. You, you, you shouldn't be doing that anyways. Unless you, unless you live in Germany. I and, mean. And, and we're not just saying that to be to be ninnies. I mean, I'm sorry. I like to go fast, but if you're going to find an empty highway and go 150 miles an hour, that's just stupid and reckless. You can go to the Silver State Classic and do that. I, I I'm totally on board with you, man. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of crazy that we're getting into a horsepower war with 700, 800, yeah, 1,000, 1,500. It's just. It's all I, just I've, it's all just smoke and mirrors and completely useless. I've driven I've driven a lot of fast cars in my time like a lot of like high performance cars and 400 to 450 is just perfect. You can enjoy That's all it. I want. You yep. don't have you to worry about it, it. You can just you can just let it rip. Yep. Wow. Digital high five. Boom. <laughs> Wham. We even we even silenced Bruce on that. One. Bruce no, is I, like I I, I well, can't I'm not disagreeing with you. I just had nothing to add. Like, I agree with you guys. I might put the number maybe a tad lower, just depending on the car. But yeah, that that feels about right. Well, if you have a good car with good balance, decent traction on the back. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm thinking back to the to the Terminator Cobra I had. That was about 500 horsepower. Um, that was that was pretty manageable. And I mean, it, I thought the car was decent, but I mean, it's still not the pinnacle of, of you ultimate know, balance. The the thing is about really fast cars, and I, I think to that McLaren or uh, Maserati MC20 and the McLaren 720S, which are the two most powerful, like fastest fastest accelerating cars, and the 911 Turbo, the fastest accelerating cars I've driven in the past year or so. You know, I I am not a a outstanding driver by any means, but I have some experience. Someone that doesn't have that experience their mind can't process that kind of performance. Mm-hmm. And it's the same concern I have over, you know, Tesla selling a car that gets to 60 in 2.8, 2.8 or 2.5 seconds. You, no one needs that kind of performance. 400 to 450 horsepower, you're always going to have performance that is invigorating, but never endangering. And yeah, that's that's kind of what it comes down to. You want to be safe, but still have fun. Okay. And and I mean, yeah, there'll be a I, lot of I'm people that buy those cars. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm kind of with you there. If you want a, fa- a car that's going to go do 60 miles an hour in two seconds, fine. You just you just better either. I almost wonder if there should be some additional licensing at this point because there absolutely, buying, I, I, absolutely I mean, think there should you're be. buying something that can be horrifically dangerous to somebody that just has yeah. no idea what they're doing. And if yeah, you have I more mean, money than brains, and I mean, let's be honest, there's some of that out there. Um, you jump into one of those. You don't process just how much ground you're going to cover in such a short amount of time. And the next yeah, thing you know, boom. There are so many things that got to go through your mind. You've got to think about, you know, the surface in front of you. You've got to look at traffic. You've got to look. Do you have to, you have to know the road? And are you going to have to make any evasive action? There's, there's so many factors that come into it before you deploy that kind of power. And yep. if and you're you have to look to make those way decisions, down the road. You have, that, way that, the hell down the that's, road. That's the thing that but, but, I think most people but don't even. Get. Even beyond that, you you have to excel, accept the fact that your brain is going to struggle to process the, the performance that you're going to deploy. You know, you get this really interesting feeling in your face. Like it kind of is like a tingly feeling in your face when you really nail it and you get to like 60 in two and a half seconds. And if you're not prepared for that, then you're going to get into an accident. That's, that's all there is to it. I'm with you. Do we want to do a quick lightning round or do we want to call it a night? You guys decide. Let's let's do it's, it's you, you guys. You want to do um, 
Instead of a lightning rod. nothing to do with video games. <laughs> I, I'm I've, I've totally gotten week. back into snow running all the last same, few days. Same here, yeah. Um, Mass Effect Legendary Edition, guys. Oh, oh you yeah. got that? How is it? It's I mean, the, the 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 originals were brilliant, so it's it's a great way to sink in like ninety hours if you're looking for time to burn. Well, see, I I never played the originals. I just got into. Oh, you should play the original. Talk. So, so, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, so instead of a lightning round, how about we just do like a quick um, honorable mention? Some other stuff we had on our lists. Sure, sounds good. I'll go first because I okay. got mine on. You go, top you of go mine. first. Uh, Over overrated and underrated. Oh. Uh, so here's my underrated overrated. I'll have to look up for you. So 89 to 93 Celica, uh, all track turbo. That was, that was overrated. Underrated. Under. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is definitely uh, underrated. Definitely it's, underrated. Bravo. Just totally forgotten. I, I pulled up, uh, I was looking online. I did a conversion calculator with options. That was like a $55,000 car in modern money. Um, which is, kind of a premium Supra. So it was expensive. Not many people bought them. It was, you know, a rally car for the road before any people cared about those. And, you know, the few that are out there, just no one really even still kind of knows about them. So venture, venture to Northern lower Michigan outside of Gaylord, Atlanta for snowdrift in January. You are guaranteed to see like a fleet of those all tracks. I, I would it, be it, happy it's, to like a, it's like an annual convention. Um, okay. And I I don't have an overrated. So, Brandon, you go. Uh, I am going to say my underrated and overrated. And I just want to build on the point that we that started this conversation at the beginning of the of the show. Overrated and underrated is the Porsche 911. Because Depending on which one, sure. If we're talking, if we're talking about new ones, that's what I'm referring to as new ones. Okay. You can build a really boring 911. Really, really boring. It can be silver, it can be white, or it can be black, or and it can have a black interior, and it can be an automatic, and can I, you know, it's dull. Mm-hmm. But man, if you play with the Porsche configurator, you can build a killer car. There's so many cool options in there. Like Give me and like each Miami one costs Blue, like like five. Yeah, but who cares? But who cares? <laughs> but who cares? Give me a C2S in Miami blue with gold wheels and a houndstooth interior. And that is just cool as hell. And it is incredibly underrated as a driver's car. And in going back to what Jeff, you know, was saying, or what I said to Jeff, it's true. The 911 is so good at literally everything. Like it is, it is a great car to buy, but if you're going to buy one, do not get silver and black. Just don't. Oh. Yeah, I think it's fair. Have some fun. Indulge. It's a sports car. Paint it lime green. Buy cool colors, you cowards. I think that's a Clint. Buy cool quote. shit. Full stop. Like <laughs> there you go. You know, it's it's interesting you bring up nine eleven because for my underrated list, I was going to say I also had a nine a new nine eleven Carrera. Because when you talk about nine eleven, so many people just want to jump to turbo or GT three. And I'm sorry, but I mean, a modern 911 Carrera, Brandon, you could attest to this. A modern 911 Carrera has got good power, good balance. It's yeah, just man, a fun car to drive. And it's like, li- listen, you, you don't have to go crazy, right? I've, you know, in the past year, I've driven, I think it's, yeah, it's been less than a year. I've driven a 911 Carrera for a C4S, a Targa 4S, a Turbo, and... I think there was something else in there that I'm forgetting, but I've driven the Targa was the favorite of the bunch that you drove. That was a cool drive. No, it wasn't actually that my favorite was the C4S oh. with the manual, which okay. was, which was amazing. But um, yeah, there, there are just, there's something to be said about the base model, but what I'm really waiting for is the, and I, they have not told me this. I'm not breaking any embargoes. I don't know if this is happening. I'm only assuming it's happening. But the new 911, yeah, I took that picture. Um, yeah. <laughs> the I know it's a great new, picture. The new 911 Carrera T when that comes out, because the that will be the base powertrain, but with a bunch of performance items that are standard on the S or optional on the S that are not otherwise available on the with the base powertrain, and that is the best of both worlds car. Uh, it's going to be you know reasonable performance. It's going to have 
all the handling goodies and upgraded brakes and, and probably some other special stuff. And yeah, that car is just going to be freaking dynamite when it finally happens. Cool. cool. Let me, let me add one more thing here on my overrated list. And I'm uniquely qualified to say this Ford Mustang. Sorry to my Mustang friends that are listening. They're you got to clarify cars, how many Mustangs have you owned to be able to say that I, I've only owned three. Are you saying That's underrated not, or overrated uh, for this? Overrated. Okay. Overrated. They're they're good cars. The new ones, uh, hey, they got great power. But it's just the hype is just ridiculous. And maybe it's because I've been involved with various clubs over the years. I know each each car with a passionate following will have passionate supporters and people that are really into the car. But I've been in a few different clubs. I've been I've joined with other kind of competing clubs, if you will, you know, some of the Mopar guys, some of the Camaro guys. Um, I've just never seen people completely lose their mind over a car like the Mustang. And I just don't get it. And honestly, it even makes it hard for me to be in clubs just because all they want to do is trash other people's cars. I was even, I, when I had my, my O3 Terminator, uh, my Cobra, I was even trying to join a Terminator Cobra club because I, I just I love the car. Mm-hmm. And all they did was trash talk like the new 50 Mustang guys. And it, it just ah, uh, it just seems like take a breath, step back, just enjoy the car. It's not the end all be all. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think when you talk about pony cars, it's it's just it's gotten really overrated. Um I can't wait to see an electric Mustang come out and just smoke all of the internal combustion Mustangs. This is coming from a guy that has an older 5.0 in his garage that is very loud, but I'm ready for the electric revolution. And yeah, so send your hate mail to podcast at motor1.com. I will respond to you, Mustang people. <laughs> I will happily respond and politely respond. Of course. But yeah, overrated, overrated, overrated. All right. Well, Woo. I think. I think that wraps things up for tonight. Yeah. Is there anybody we didn't piss off with this episode? I hope uh, not. We didn't talk. We didn't really talk anything we didn't about, talk about Tesla people. No Tesla oh, people. Oh, okay. That's well. Maybe that's go, we, don't don't have time. we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time in this podcast for me to go we, out about. Tesla we don't have enough time yeah. in any podcast for that. Right. I think. Tesla would be infinitely more tolerable if Elon Musk didn't exist. There, I agree. No, that's fair. That that's yeah. Totally I'm, fair. I'm, I think I'm with you there too. Yeah. Great, so, great. Okay, I don't want to say great cars. Adequate cars, okay. not great well, cars. Adequate cars. Okay, uh, we're gonna stop before I. I we, we could we could yeah. also say Harley Davidsons are overrated. I don't know if anybody just heard the straight pipe Harley that went by my <laughs> open window. Um, might be a little little bit of overrating there, but another episode for another time. That's right. Podcast at motor one.com. Catch us online. Every Fridays, we have new episodes that drop. We post them on motor one.com. You can get them on YouTube. You can get us on Spotify, on Apple podcasts, Bruce. Yeah. Take us, take us home, man. Yeah. So as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Whenever you happen to listen to us, we appreciate you being here. Like Smith said, podcast at motor one.com is the email address. Whether you want to, you know, educate us about a model that we didn't know about like that Dodge or whether we got the year of the Honda Civic introduction wrong, like a few weeks ago, <laughs> or you just want to praise us, which we get those too. Like all of it is appreciated. Like, you know, we can we love cars, but no one is an expert on every single car that is on the road ever. Like that just doesn't exist. True story. And so we love getting your feedback and we love the fact that you listen to us and you trust us with getting our feedback, your feedback. So thank you. And just uh, to, uh, to go behind the curtain, episodes of this show, we kind of try to balance timely where we talk about news and timeless, where it's just a bunch of people talking about cars, whether they're new or old. So you got kind of today. Exactly. You got one of the episodes that anyone could pick this up, this episode up at any time and listen to it. And it's going to be fresh. And we like doing that. We like having a balance of both of those things. So we hope you do too. And thank you. And good evening. Bye-bye. Bye everybody.